Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT podcast. Your all access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. True or false, porn desensitizes people to genuine intimacy. Or wait, one more. True or false? Porn use is a normal, healthy expression of human sexuality. As you can see, for most people and therapists, porn can sometimes be a confusing and polarizing topic that can easily trigger our negative countertransference. But the fact is, there's more people in the United States, potential clients that we have, visit porn sites each month than they do Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter combined. So today we're going to talk about, from an MFT perspective, how to assess if porn is or isn't a problem in your client's relationships and how to avoid the therapeutic potholes in the process. And we're going to review what our guest calls ethical porn and how it can be used to help clients with a range of common sexual problems that we see in our practices as MFTs. And we're going to do that with a notable figure in the field of sex therapy MFT. That's Dr. Ian Kerner. Ian is a licensed MFT and nationally recognized sexuality educator who specializes in sex therapy, couples therapy, and working with individuals on a range of relational issues that often lead to distress. He approaches psychotherapy from an integrative perspective, which seeks to explain human behavior by bringing together physiological, effective, cognitive behavioral, neurobiological components with a systemic overlay. Ian is regularly quoted as an expert in various media outlets, including national outlets like The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Economist, and NPR, among others. You may have seen him on the Psychotherapy Network Symposium, and he's done a TED Talk. He's a New York Times bestselling author of numerous books, including She Comes First from HarperCollins, which has been translated into more than a dozen languages. His new book, So Tell Me About the Last Time You Had Sex is now available from Grand Central Publishing. In addition to being a clinical fellow at the AAMFT, Ian is certified by the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, that's known as ASECT, and he's sat on their board of directors. He's also a member of the Society for Sex Therapy Research and the American Family Therapy Academy, AFTA. His practice is composed equally of heterosexual and LGBTQ clients and is split between individuals and couples. I really learned a lot, a very thoughtful conversation, and we will be back after the interview. So happy to be joined by Ian Kerner today on the AAMFT podcast, and we are talking about something I think every systemic couples therapist needs to know, uh, talking about erotica, pornography, and usually that has a negative connotation. Today, we're going to talk about how that can actually be helpful and what you need to know and be knowledgeable in order to help the couples you work with. But Ian, if you've ever listened to the show, the first question is always, how did you get interested in working with couples? Yeah. Hi, Eli. It's great to be here, and that's an interesting question. I have to be honest, my interest in sex therapy and working with sexuality kind of preceded my interest in in couples work, although I absolutely love couples and the vast majority of my patient base are couples. What really brought me into this field was my interest in sexuality and the fact that I had had my own struggles with sexual dysfunction and sexual confusion uh, as a younger person. And I had felt very alone and, and very distressed and very fatalistic and not knowing where to get good information. And really my journey to sexual health was one of feeling heard by other therapists and being listened to and and feeling normalized and it really helped me to become comfortable and grounded in my own sexuality and my own sexual differences and 
it was always an inspiring experience for me. And when I sort of had some change of life stuff happening, I, I knew that I really wanted to get involved clinically and professionally in the world of sexuality. And then that gradually led me to pursue becoming a couples therapist. And today I work on a whole range of issues with couples, but I would say sexuality is still at the center of my work. When couples come into my practice, they've picked me because they want their sexual selves to speak to each other in ways that they cannot speak to each other. So having a practice that really honors the centrality of sexuality in individuals and couples' relationships is, is core to my work. We talk about on this show practicing within our scope of competence and many relationship-based therapists, LMFTs, when they're working with couples, one of the common threads, even if they have a good sexual history going into it, is usually if they're having problems, in many ways it's manifested in the sexual relationship. So as an MFT trainer, I'm always like, you have to expand your competence to work with couples on sexual issues. So to get us started today, what do you think are the major changes in the areas of sex addiction research and treatment that today's couples therapists and systemic therapists need to know about? Yeah, well, when I was starting out in this field, the only language to describe one's relationship with problematic or dysregulated sexuality was the, the term sex addiction. And it was, it was so part of the cultural dialogue and the clinical dialogue that you didn't even really challenge that concept. You just accepted it. Sex addiction, that's what you were trained in to deal with and to work with clinically. And so I think for me, the biggest changes that have happened, and it's very interesting to also watch myself grow as a therapist and watch what you accept and watch what you refute and watch what you question and challenge and when you start to question and challenge, because again, I basically just accepted the concept of sex addiction and worked with it and worked with treatment modalities like recommending 12-step groups and, and abstinence and, and sex rehabs early in my career. And then the language really started to change. And, and it went from being around sex addiction to finding more nuanced ways of understanding understanding people's problematic relationships with their own sexuality and, and actually, again, affected my own relationship with porn and, and with masturbation. So again, in, in working in this field, I am a sexual person. Uh, I never attempt to bring my own biases or experiences or judgment into the room, but, but I am a sexual person. And as culture and definitions and clinical definitions change, I change too. But I would say the biggest change has been going from an addiction model to really going to a much more nuanced model that where the treatment modalities and ends up being a more of a harm reduction uh, model and just not using the term addiction. I use the term, what often gets used clinically is out of control sexual behavior because out of control sexual behavior is frankly something that can be brought in control. That means that clients can gain a sense of mastery, whereas uh, addiction you're sort of more powerless. Uh, you don't have that same mastery. Now, I even find the term out of control sexual behaviors a little too big, a little too impactful for my taste. Sex addiction, out of control sexual behaviors. I tend to use the term problematic sexual behaviors uh, in my discussions with other clinicians and my talking with clients. So that's where I'm comfortable with the language, but you can already hear from going from sex addiction to a problematic sexual behavior. It's, it's completely di different because problems can be solved. Problems uh, are complex. A behavior is not a thought or an urge. It's a behavior. So there's a lot of complexity in the language we use and how we let that language guide us. I think in our field, people pick MFT because of a systemic nature, the emphasis on strength and health. And we take, that doesn't mean you ignore pathology if it's staring you in the face, but you look for strength and health. So I think the language shaping meaning and moving away from an addiction model to more of problematic sexual behavior rather than sexual dysfunction and even the branding of the field is sexual enhancement now. And if you come to a couples therapist that it's normalizing the ebb and flow of sexuality within a pair bond and it doesn't have to be a negative thing. So I think the framework of how you view it and the language you use is certainly important. So I'm glad to hear you say that. 
also, I mean, we're going to talk about porn pornography today. And almost always, I think in our field, that had a negative connotation. I don't think in the context of a committed couple relationship is that's not necessarily the same thing anymore. So what do you think are the biggest misconceptions about pornography as it pertains to couples and sexual health? Yeah, well, you mentioned something that's so important, Eli, that even in saying problematic sexual behavior, we're sort of lumping porn in on the problematic side. And, you know, in fact, for me in my work with couples, porn is often a solution. It's often a way of starting to generate mind-based arousal together. It's often a way of discovering a sexual adventurousness. It's often a way of having a conversation around porn. It's a way of stimulating libido. So I want to say that one of the big shifts also away from the addiction model has been, a, as you said, an enhancement model and a, a porn positive model. So, so your question is, what are some of the biggest misconceptions? Well, I think some of the biggest misconceptions are that A, porn is addictive. Very often couples have discrepant sex drives. It's, it's not unusual for one partner to be a higher desire partner. It's not unusual for one partner to be highly reactive to sexual cues, right? I am highly reactive to sexual cues. I, I see things. If my wife comes out of the shower, uh, I, can, I can feel that in my body if I'm a little turned on, right? So I'm highly reactive to sexual cues. My wife, on the other hand, is just a sexual person, but she doesn't respond to sexual cues in the way. She needs more contextual factors, more of a cascade of cues. Well, you can imagine in a relationship where porn is misunderstood that someone who simply has highly reactive desire to sexual cues and may express those feelings in their body by turning to porn, that doesn't mean they're an addict, but they may very well get labeled as an addict because they're in a different desire framework. So the idea that porn is uh, addictive and the idea that that addiction hurts relationships, the idea that uh, porn saps your desire, the idea that porn um, desensitizes you to real sex or distracts you from your real interest in, in human partnered sex. I mean, I think that these are all misconceptions. I work with so many men who love their partners and love their porn but they love their partners and they love sex with their partners more. They love actual partnered sex more. Another misconception is that if uh, a person, and it's usually a man in a relationship, not to say that I don't work with women who occasionally have a problematic relationship with porn. I certainly work with a lot lot of women who love and enjoy porn, but usually it's uh, the man who has a problematic relationship with porn in the couple. And another misconception is if there's any sexual dysfunction in the relationship, low libido, erectile unpredictability. Now notice that. That might be the first time a lot of your listeners have heard that term to describe what used to be called impotence, what used to be called erectile dysfunction or erectile disorder. I'm using a term erectile unpredictability. Again, a movement, as you said, towards enhancement, towards being sex positive, to depathologizing. But the first thing that people will blame their sexual issues on, whether it's a couple or an individual in a couple, is their porn use. You know, I I think broadly, Eli, what I want to say is that um, the reason people sometimes blame porn is because porn is is easy, right? It's it's easy to watch porn and masturbate. It's it's privacy. Uh, There's no expectations. You're not worried about being observed. You're not worried about your partner's pleasure, you can relax. So in a certain sense, when we're watching porn, it's very easy to get aroused. It's very easy to have orgasm. And yet, actual partnered sex is complex. It's a dance, right? You have to you have to learn the steps. You have to read and intuit your partner. You have to deal with your partner's strengths and challenges and point of view and personhood and subjectivity. Real sex is intersubjective. So on the one hand, Porn is easy, relationships are hard, and when relationships get hard, when sex gets hard, if porn is in the picture, porn tends to get blamed. To talk about ethical porn, another, I think, misconception is all porn is tawdry and demeaning to women, and I think there's a lot of porn, especially that couples therapists working with sexual issues refer to, and there's a big movement 
in pornography as far as porn made especially for women that does not have this degrading pejorative context to it. you know one of the first questions when i'm working with couples who i think need to work on amplifying arousal and amplifying desire i talk about the ways in which they get aroused and i ask them about the ways they get aroused and generally it's all physically based and i and i will ask them well how do you generate mind-based arousal right the arousal that you get from sharing a fantasy or or watching something and or, or reading something and generally couples are not engaging in mind-based arousal and they want to and they want some homework to help start getting their mind generating arousal. And so I'll often ask them, well, let's do a homework assignment. I call this sort of side-by-side stimulation because you're going home and you're reading something aloud side-by-side or you're listening to an erotica podcast or I'll say, you can watch some ethical porn. And it's a leading question because almost every patient is going to ask ethical porn? What is ethical porn? And there's a huge difference between ethical porn and the porn that we get from the tube sites like Pornhub. Ethical porn, first and foremost, costs something. Just like a cup of fair trade coffee costs a little more than a regular cup of coffee. When you pay for ethical porn and it doesn't cost much more than that cup of coffee, you know a few things or or you're closer to knowing a few things. That the actors are being remunerated, that uh, copyrights are being respected, that uh, there's consent, that the actors have very often a lot of input into the scripts themselves. They want to be there. So there's certain protections um, that can make you feel comfortable watching porn. But more than that, when you're paying for porn and it's ethical porn, it's not driven by advertising and who's clicking on what and money shots and whatever the latest trend is that gets the most clicks. We're finding in ethical porn a diversity of performers, ethnicities, uh, body shapes, uh, sexual orientations and gender identities. There are real stories being told. There are real people and directors and writers who take the form seriously and increasingly ethical porn is seeping into the mainstream. So that's sort of the difference between ethical porn and once I explain it to couples, many are interested. Very often the woman, the female partner, has less uh, exposure to porn overall and has more interest in watching ethical porn. And quite frequently it's the male partner who grew up hiding his porn and being shameful around porn that, that really can't cross that divide into turning porn into a shared experience. But, but in some, that's sort of the difference between uh, ethical porn and I guess what I'll just call the free porn of, say, Pornhub. Let's play some scenarios here because our listeners like news you can use and things that uh, apply to them. So a a couple comes in in an opening session. You know they're having some problem with intimacy and let's even be more specific, physical intimacy or sex. But many therapists, if they haven't had specific training in this, they will not bring up something that could be potentially embarrassing to a client or if they're unsure of how they feel about it, they might not bring up pornography. So tell us about how you should assess the role of pornography when working with couples, even if the couple doesn't mention it as an issue. Should you always, if they're having sexual or physical difficulties, should you always bring it up? First of all, I'm more likely to bring it up in a positive way, again, when couples lack um, that mind-based arousal. And by mind-based arousal, Eli, just to be clear, I mean, we know that uh, women can fantasize their, many women can fantasize their way to orgasms without touching themselves at all. That's mind-based arousal. When I send men home who have erectile unpredictability and I'm giving them homework to see if it's organic or psychological psychological or the extent, I'll sometimes ask those men the next time you're going to masturbate and turn on some hot porn, uh, you know, keep your hands at your side and tell me what happens. And most men are able to gain workable erections within, you know, two to three minutes. So that's the power of mind-based arousal. So if a couple is lacking mind-based arousal, whether it's the kind they can generate just between themselves or through watching something or doing something, I'm likely to bring porn up when it has not been mentioned at all in the context of broader what's called really clinically psychogenic arousal. Now I don't bring up porn 
if it's not addressed as a problem. I'm not looking to, you know, dig for a problem. And, and I'll tell you, when porn is an issue, it comes up. And, and I suppose it also comes up in the context of how safe patients feel with you and how emotionally safe they feel in the room around the conversation of sexuality and the topic of sexuality. And that's where just generally having good access to scientific information is important so that you can really hold that space. But I have found that most of the time, you know, when porn is a problem, they're presenting the problem. Now, that may be that I'm sort of widely known as a sex therapist in this field. So those couples are are coming to me sort of ready to talk or have already identified it as a problem. Again, I would not go looking to see if porn is a problem. Uh, Problems present themselves. Now, I also, just so you know, I take an approach where I tend to look at sexuality systemically and pretty big picture. By that I mean I take a a biopsychosocial perspective. I'm often looking at a sexual event as a almost like a a play that has act one, act two, act three with various components. So very often in talking about from a systemic perspective, the the biopsychosocial lenses by by looking at at sex as an event, the last time someone had sex that's determined in so many different ways, very often porn will come up as part of that overall analysis. It may come up in doing a sexual history I don't always jump into sexual history, that's another conversation, but there are ways in which you will be generally assessing your patient that you can listen for porn being a problem and start to tease it out a little bit, or you may just end up giving your patients the kind of question or prompt that brings it out. Not always, but most of the time, a female partner discovers her husband has been looking at porn or sees the phone or the iPad, but it feels almost like a violation, a breach of trust, and it stirs up things in the relationship where maybe for the gentleman that had always been a part of his sexual life, but because their sexual relationship had been good, it it hadn't been something to talk about. Uh, another partner is very offended by that. I had this other couple come in the other day uh, and the woman said, as long as I'm the first option, I don't have a problem with him looking at porn. When I start becoming the second, option, then I do have a problem with it. So sometimes you will see it presented like that. What are your thoughts about a discovery of a relatively normative behavior, but just a couple hasn't talked about it, and then the partner feels violated or offended that their partner has been been watching watching porn? porn. Yeah, then it's coming in and it almost feels like we're working with a form of infidelity and there's been that kind of violation. And in many cases, the porn itself is not the problem, it's it's the secrecy, it's that the porn was hidden and it was in an underground, and as we know from doing couples work, secrecy uh, can really amplify an, any kind of issue. What's also getting triggered is uh, partner's beliefs about porn, right? Is porn bad? Does porn objectify? Is porn unnecessary in a relationship? If my partner's watching porn, does it mean he's not interested in sex with me? Does it mean he wants sex with the, the, type, the types of sex that he's watching in porn or with the types of people he's seeing in porn? And generally, that's not the case at all. So here we have a guy who probably has a pretty healthy relationship with porn. Most men I work with do, but they have a pretty even regulated relationship, but something's been discovered, and now there's urgency in the air, and there's panic in the air, and that, that's when couples don't communicate well. So we have to de-escalate them. We have to have a conversation about it. We don't want a, a rush to outcomes, like I'm never gonna watch porn again, I promise. You're right, I'm only gonna make you my priority, because the other thing I've noticed that you really have to work with when you're working with uh, sex and with porn is ambivalence, right? Part of the big issue with the sex addiction model is that it's so binary. You have to give up porn. Often for a period of time, you have to give up masturbation. You have to give up what might be construed as unhealthy versions of sex altogether, right? So someone is already taking on a sort of all or nothing structure. And all or nothing structures tend to be constraining and they tend to set our patients up to to fail, right? To fail when you can't, when it's all or nothing. So I always also want to work with ambivalence and what someone is really willing to do. You know, maybe that guy who's watching porn, maybe he's really willing to give up 
the chat rooms because that's more of a two-way thing than just you know pure porn or maybe he's willing to tell his partner he wants to watch porn uh, but maybe he's not willing when when he wants to watch porn maybe he he'll even offer her the chance I mean they can come up with an agreement but this guy may not want to give up porn but very often in that sort of panicked environment people make promises that aren't necessarily sensible and promises that they can't keep so in working with sexuality on the whole and in working with porn i really want to work in on de-escalation of the couple and i really want to work with the gray areas and the ambivalence what do we do with someone that has a value system or morality where they feel porn is bad. And if you have a sex positive, a porn positive perspective as a therapist, you have a client that has a very rigid value system around pornography. Yeah, so sometimes people come in and they've had very, let's just say, strong religious upbringings and they have a shameful relationship with porn. Anytime they watch porn, they feel ashamed about it. Now, that may be simply they feel ashamed about watching any porn or they may be seeking out a kind of porn that connects to a you know, a broader rigidity where maybe they have some kind of erotic conflict that just doesn't have any way of getting expressed except through porn. By that I mean somebody who may be bisexual or just isn't heteronormative or is is gay but is again part of a, a part of a cultural structure where not only do you not watch porn, you have sex in a certain way and sex has a certain procreative function and uh, you marry in a certain way. So sometimes someone's use of porn in that situation can be indicative of erotic conflicts uh, that are underneath the viewing that porn is a kind of a place to express their authentic sexuality or sometimes they're just much quicker to label themselves as a porn addict and yet they are watching porn and they are masturbating so you know that that's a place where I'll bring in a lot of sex education, um, uh, psychoeducation. I'll really try and normalize the use. I'll try and normalize masturbation and porn. If they really can't take it, and I've seen this with couples actually who um, I've worked with that that have religious upbringings uh, that are pretty strict, and porn has been discovered. Sometimes they're really willing to navigate to sharing fantasies or reading erotica, some other form of erotic stimulation that just isn't porn. So I'm not looking to deconstruct someone's attitudes around porn, but I am looking to sort of expand their conception of their sexuality. Sometimes I'll work with someone who has a a dysregulated relationship with porn and a lot of conflict around it. Maybe on a harm reduction model, I'll say to them, well, it seems like you really want to gain control over this and you feel like it's controlling you and you're addicted. And how many times are you watching porn? And they might say, once a week. I don't find that uh, dysregulated or problematic, but uh, this person does once a week, or maybe they'll say twice a week. So I'll say, well, how about, can we cut that in half? Can we cut that in a third? So sometimes just allowing people to take incremental steps where they feel like they're starting to have mastery over the parts of their sexuality that seem dark and dangerous is helpful. An ideal couple working with this is a couple that wants to grow in their sexual relationship or buy into the frame of sexual enhancement and sexual health and are coming to a therapist because they want to either continue the dialogue, even if people are really physically compatible and have a good chemistry that way, sex ebbs and flows, even the healthiest sex drives over the life course of a relationship. So the dialogue, being able to talk about it is so important. So sometimes is. MFTs working with couples and sexual issues, we help them with that dialogue. You've already given some insight into some great interventions. I love what you said about mind-based arousal. And many of our listeners have probably never heard of the framing of erectile unpredictability. So this stuff is great. Give us some other essential interventions or psychoeducations that you think every couples therapist should know in doing this work. In assessing porn, if it's presented in any way as problematic, what I really want therapists to understand is to think of the porn use as a symptom and and not the cause. You know, very often in a an addiction model, well, let's let's not be addicted. The, the addiction, whatever it is, the substance is the problem. Yes, we know there's underlying stuff that led to the addiction but we really want to stop the addiction. When couples come in or individuals come in 
with problematic porn use, it's usually symptomatic of something else, you know, being depressed, you know, and using porn as an outlet, being stressed and using porn to regulate anxiety, not having enough healthy coping mechanisms and helping a patient to develop healthy coping mechanisms, having that erotic conflict that needs to be looked at, explored and validated, maybe something related to a partner's, uh, a person's attachment uh, schema, maybe they're extremely avoidant in their relationships and just porn is really their easy safe place or maybe they form extremely anxious attachments and when they're not with their partner or don't have a partner that anxiety finds an outlet in porn so, you know one of the main things I look for is to treat porn and the use as a symptom also to distinguish between thought urge and behavior right in our imaginations uh, we have lots of sexual thoughts, and they're often extremely taboo. Sometimes, more rarely, those thoughts lead to urges that we feel a little uh, controlled by or a little impulsive, and, and sometimes, even, even more rarely, those urges lead to behaviors. But from a thought to a behavior, it's quite a path and they're all quite different. So there are different ways of looking at problematic sexual behaviors, especially from that systemic perspective. But Eli, I think your question was addressing more how to introduce it in a positive way. Yeah, in a positive way, or if they want to grow in that way. So a couple is coming in and they want to, even if they have a good sexual history, continue to grow and they're open to using different tools or resources or media or erotica to help doing that? How, how do you work with a couple like that, that where they don't see it as a problem, but they're uneducated and they want something to continue the dialogue and to try new things? You know, sometimes that couple can come in and just say, we want a more expansive journey in our sex lives. We want to keep growing. Sex has gotten, uh, it's not that it's stale, but it's, it's maybe a little bit uh, predictable. Or they might come in addressing, you know, some kind of issue like low desire, some function issue. So very often what uh, I want to do is get an understanding of, first of all, what sort of sex looks like for them and, and get that big picture view. You know, and very often for the couple who's looking to expand their sex lives in some way that feels alive and experiential, Generally, that journey isn't happening. It may have happened in the very beginning of the relationship where there was a lot of mystery and unpredictability and just a lot of new information coming in to uh, generate arousal. But very often when couples want to re-expand their sex lives, it's often because sex has become a little dehydrated of its uh, erotic life. It's become more a series of behaviors or a menu uh, that you put together that lacks that erotic life. So I will very often in just talking about a couple's sex life start to target where an issue is and, and where they might benefit from watching porn. Again, it could be in, in generating mind-based arousal. Mind-based arousal is so important to sex because it allows you to get present, it allows you to get absorbed, it helps you to tune out all the distractions and stressors that are getting in the way of sex. It allows you to activate your sexual brain and, and feel sexualized in your life. We are living right now through, I, I would say, uh, and I've been doing this a long time, a renaissance in the proliferation of sex toys that are creative, that are well-designed, that are fun, that are therapeutic. Again, a revolution in ethical porn, erotic audio, audio podcasts, apps that help couples to, or individuals to connect with sexuality. So I think if you're taking a sex positive approach, which I encourage everyone to do, you got to sort of open your eyes and look around at, at all the fabulous resources that are, are here for the taking. It's like being two actors on a stage and going into that trunk to look for costumes and props. There's, there's so much out in the world to stimulate our imagination. So, you know, very often in the world of sex therapy, Again, it's about being educated. It's about knowing the resources that are available to couples because it hasn't entered their minds really. Or if it has entered their minds, uh, they certainly haven't talked about it with each other. So really knowing the possibilities that are available and, and being able to offer those possibilities to, to patients. So that's why doing sex therapy, it's so important to 
just stay attuned to the science and what's happening in the world of sexuality, to be linked up with other practitioners that you can refer people to. And again, porn uh, and recommending it is is one of those ways of, of being resourced. So, and, you know, I, I gave a, a lecture at the Psychotherapy Network and I mentioned ethical porn and I mentioned literary erotica. And I said, you know, when patients ask me, well, where do I go? Where do I find this? Uh, I have a list that I've started of, of sites that I've accumulated that I think are quality. It's, it's just a drop in the bucket, but it's a start. It's something that I can email to patients to start to look at as part of their journey into sharing porn together, because that's often one of my homework assignments if they agree on that, and very often they do. So I'll send them the list. And then we've decided, we've decided ahead of time, are you going to review the list together and go through it together? Are you each going to review the list and find something to bring that you like to each other? Or maybe it's going to, let's make it more fun. Why don't you bring something that you think your partner will like? How well do you know your partner sexually? Go pick the ethical porn that you think maps to your partner's fantasies. So it's a lot of specific guidance. It's offering options. And then within those options, it's having the resourcing to allow them to uh, actualize on those options. Being prepared as a therapist, having resources, being comfortable with it is so important. And you mentioned your own journey and your personal life, which inspired you wanting to do this type of work. And I train young therapists in, in our couples therapy course, when we start talking about sex and working with couples around sexual issue and pornography, it, it's very polarizing. You have some therapists in training that are very excited and that's the type of work they want to do. Other people are like, they cringe. It's hard for them to watch the psychoeducational videos and things like that. So let's spend our, our last time talking about kind of self of therapist issues. If this is the kind of work you're going to do, and I will even say more strongly in, in my state in Kentucky, probably only four or five ASEC therapists, it may be much different in New York, but I believe we are relational healers, MFTs, systemic therapists. They, they're the ones that see the couples. And with many couples, as we said, these sexual issues are embedded in their cycles. So we are the ones doing the work. It's imperative that we get this education and kind of assess our own comfort level in doing this. So I am curious what you think about self of therapist development issues around being comfortable, not just with pornography, sex, working with sexual issues in general as young therapists. Well, Eli, earlier you asked me a question about assessing for porn use when it's uh, not presented as a problem. So if I broaden out from that question, I think the bigger question is, what do you do as therapists when you're working with couples and they haven't brought sex into the room at all? Maybe you've been working with someone for, for three months and they have never brought sex into the room. Are you obligated or should you start talking about sex? Do you just leave it alone? Alone because it's not a, a presenting problem, even though they've talked about so many other aspects of their lives and their system. So I believe that sexuality is, is a glue in a relationship. It's a vital energy. The very definition of eros is life force. So if you're going to truly work systemically, I don't really understand how you would leave sexuality and one's relationship to sexuality and one's sexual history and intergenerational history around sex. I don't know how you'd leave that out of the room. It's kind of like professional malpractice. I can't imagine working with a couple for a long time and not assessing the intimate sexual physical bond in some way. Absolutely. So you have to figure out how to do that and how to bring sex into the room. And I'll very often, you know, most Most people know who I am, so they pick me because I know that there's some aspect of sex they want to work on, even if it doesn't come up in the first session. So I can say, well, we've been talking about A, B, C, and D, and money, and in-laws, and uh, well, what about sex and intimacy? Uh, How's that going for you? How is just overall intimacy, romance, and connection? Those are the words couples often use to describe sex. Very often when they're talking about wanting romance, uh, intimacy, uh, to a lesser extent, connection. Those are sort of the code words for sex. So sometimes you have to tease it out. And I do think you'd be irresponsible not to. But then you really have to understand your own relationship with sexuality and your own comfort with sexuality. Because even after doing this work for 20 years, when someone comes in with a sex problem, it may be a common problem. 
but it, it's being presented through a very personalized lens that it might destabilize you a little bit. It might be like, wow, like what am I hearing? Like, and it's so multiply determined by so many different factors. Like you might feel a little like you've lost your bearing. And so that is why it is important to be calm in the topic of sexuality, to know that you don't know everything. You know, there are two very common mistakes that therapists make in the area of sexuality that are pitfalls. One is to avoid the conversation. Many couples therapists will still say, oh, well, you have a sex problem. Well, that comes back to your relationship and your connection and your attachment. Let's go there. Let's divert away. You know, having a good relationship is important to having a good sex life, but fixing the relationship doesn't fix one's sex life. On the other hand, fixing or helping one's sex life can be very, very additive to the positivity uh, in a relationship. So a lot of couples, a lot of couples therapists will under communicate or they'll quickly refer out as soon as they hear something thinking they don't have the tools to be able to handle it. So I get a lot of referrals from other couples therapists for issues that I think they honestly could have handled like mismatched libido or, or desire or even a sexual function issue just because they were a little panicked they didn't know how to deal with it so they just either distracted away buried it maybe the patients decided to terminate and come to see me because they wanted to talk about sex and the therapist never let them they actually wanted to they tried to and the therapist diverted away because the therapist felt disoriented or destabilized and directed away the other mistake that therapists tend to make young and old in the area of sex is to over communicate right suddenly sex comes up well we're all sexual people we all have sex lives we all have friends and neighbors who have sex and it's very easy to start generalizing wait a second oh it's vanilla porn or it's heterosexual porn or it's loving porn between a man and a woman great no problem that's healthy porn oh wait it's kinky it's BDSM it involves a fetish or or, or gangbangs or whatnot that's getting sick now that's getting sick that's getting uh, pathological I think we're looking now at porn addiction right so suddenly I'm making a judgment because I don't have good information. I'm jumping to a conclusion. I think there's a porn addiction in the room. Wait a second, so you're masturbating every day to porn and, and your wife doesn't like that. Yeah, I agree, I think you have a sex addiction problem. So in addition to under communicating, you can suddenly start to bring your own values and judgments and biases into the room in ways that you probably wouldn't do in other areas, on, in other content areas. How do you increase if you're a therapist that wants to improve their comfort, their knowledge, they realize that maybe the clients in some ways are more comfortable talking about sexuality than they are. And then to do the work, to be a systemic couples therapist, they have to increase their comfort with talking about sexuality and porn specifically our focus today. So, I mean, I think the difference between a great therapist and a great couples therapist and a great sex therapist the only major difference I feel is having access to scientifically informed and accurate information that you can use to formulate a problem in a relationship and, and treat that problem. So it's access to the information. So how do you get the information and how do you integrate? How do you learn? Well, I mean, you know, fortunately, we have the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors and Therapists, and there's a path to becoming certified, but there's also non-certified stuff you can do that just involve lectures and workshops. You know, in the area of porn specific, I highly recommend the work of uh, Doug Braun Harvey, who has done a lot to uh, champion the idea of out of control sexual behavior and works with men and men's groups. He's really a pioneer. The work of David Lay, L-E-Y, he's also a pioneer. These guys have all written books. Marty Klein they, is a pioneer. So those are sort of some experts that you can quickly go to that deal specifically with porn. But remember, what is porn? What is porn? First of all, porn is not masturbation. Masturbation and porn are two separate activities that often get coupled together. And sometimes a person's porn problem is actually a masturbation problem. But porn is a form of erotic stimuli that allows us to tap into our erotic minds or it surfaces stuff that's in our erotic mind. So if you really want to learn 
about porn, you also have to expand to start to think about people's fantasies and how to work with fantasies in the room and sexual dreams and, and what's what are those all about. And, and so for that, I highly recommend the work of uh, Jack Marin, uh, who wrote The Erotic Mind. It's one of my favorite books. He's, unfortunately, he's passed, but uh, The Erotic Mind is a beautiful book. I often give it. It can be bought very cheaply on Amazon used. I give copies to my patients. My patients love that book. I highly recommend the book Arousal by Michael Bader. He's a little less of a systemic thinker. He's more of an, of an analyst, but he really looks at fantasies as sort of helping us around problems that uh, get in the way of getting aroused. And those problems often go back to our childhoods and back to the systems in which we operate. So again, Doug Braun, Harvey, David Lay, Marty Klein, I know I'm listing a lot of men. I'm sorry about that. They're just the, f- the first ones that are coming to mind. Uh, Justin Lemeler, who's a sexual scientist at Kinsey, he has a, a book called Tell Me What You Want that's related to fantasy. Again, I, w- I would look at porn porn as, as a piece of working with fantasy and people's erotic minds in general. One last question for you, Ian, and this comes from a listener many times in couples therapy. Unless there is a clinical reason to break down the system, to see people individually, you want to see the couple together, promote this dialogue. But when it comes to porn, would there ever be a time when you would work with your, your modality is still couples therapy, but your session context is individual. Is there ever a time when you would break down the system? As you said, I am in the camp of keeping the work on the couple. So if I'm Me doing too. couples therapy, I really don't want to bring the individual. I don't want to go to individual. And that is especially true, Eli, with sex, because we are creating, I'm going to use the word sacred now, but we're creating a sacred space to discuss something that never gets discussed. People are already ruminating on this individually but they're not sharing those ruminations they're not getting it out so it's a sacred space to talk about a topic that rarely gets talked about so i'm very very careful about going to individual sessions and i avoid it honestly almost at all costs that said when someone actually does have a relationship with porn that I believe to be problematic. So I've been very sex positive, very porn positive in this conversation, but that does not mean that porn masturbation is not sometimes problematic in someone's life. You know, I can think of some patients that I worked with who grew up in extremely religious environments. The belief system that was inculcated in them is very much in conflict with their erotic minds and, and how they are operating sexually, and they are mired in shame and um, self-flagellation. So that would be a case where we got to like sort of look at what's happening individually and do more history work, uh, look at what's problematic. And, you know, for example, forget uh, religious background. Somebody may simply be using porn as a coping mechanism and there's nothing wrong with masturbation and orgasm as a coping mechanism it's actually i think a very healthy way of coping with difficult emotions and stress but if it's your only coping mechanism and it's being and it's become overdetermined as a coping mechanism then i might need to work with someone individually to help them expand their palate of coping mechanisms. So it's really when we're starting, I think, to hit what I'm intuiting to be really something that's a little more rigid and problematic that needs to to be looked at that I will suggest uh, individual sessions, often alternating between the individual and the couple sessions. I have enjoyed this dialogue so much, my friend. If people want to continue the dialogue with you, what is a good way to get a hold of you or follow you on social media? Yeah, I think the simplest thing is to go to my website, iankerner.com. I, I really, uh, I'm a little old school in that way. I, I keep it updated with events I'm doing. Uh, you can contact me, you can email me. Um, I'll always try and get back to someone briefly if somebody sometimes wants to really go into some case consultation uh, and I have the time. I won't do it over email, but I'll suggest we, we set up a phone conversation so go to my website, iankerner.com. Ian Kerner, thank you so much. This brings to a close another informative installment of the AAMFT podcast. As always, our guests and content areas are driven by interaction with you, the listener. You can get a hold of me, 
eli at northstarcounselingcenter.com is the email. Also, check me out, elikaram.com. That's E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M. You can follow the conversation on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Eli Live. The AMFT is simply at the AMFT. Hashtag stay systemic. I'd be remiss without telling you about some amazing things that are happening in the world of systemic therapy, specifically the AMFT coming up. I'm talking about the first ever systemic family therapy conference taking place November 10th through 12th. This, the first of its kind, will feature keynote speakers, workshops, networking, and exhibitions. It is fully virtual for the first time in 2021, bringing together attendees from every continent in the world and eliminating barriers to access. Maybe you've always wanted to go to a national or international conference, but you couldn't travel. One of the upsides of the pandemic is we have adapted to technology and these barriers to getting this great information that all systemic therapists needs is no longer a barrier. So we're bringing our community together and we're strengthening the profession to make a worldwide impact. I'm so excited about it. My colleague and I, Adrian Blow, and I will be speaking on Friday of the conference. And I promise for those attendees, I'll be breaking some pretty exciting news that I will share first for conference attendees. And I imagine we will talk about on the podcast later. But if you're interested in this first of a kind opportunity, you want to go to amft.org slash conferences. And there you'll find out everything you need to know on the Systemic Family Therapy Conference, the most comprehensive event ever for systemic therapists worldwide. So uh, happy that AMFT is sponsoring that. And I can't wait to talk about it more in upcoming weeks on the podcast. If you're a fan of the podcast, but you haven't sampled some back installments in our library, you can do that wherever you find your favorite podcast. I'm partial to Apple Podcasts, but you can also go to Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher. We really appreciate a review. It just takes a few moments, and it really makes a difference in helping us rise through the ranks of mental health podcasts. As always, until next time, my friends, stay safe and stay systemic.